Again, welcome to our uh, Docless Bike Share Community Forum. This is uh, the beginning of our policy panel, Getting Bike Share Right. And I want to just uh, take a quick moment to remind uh, Austinites that are here, we have some feedback um, uh, boards that are just exactly in front of you outside. Allison and Joel, some of our best engineers and planners are out there to hear from you, get your feedback on what's the role of the city, what's the role of the operators, and what's the role of the community in this pilot demonstration. So please take a minute to go um, and visit with Allison and Joel and share your feedback. Uh, this is the start of a month-long community engagement process. We'll have five listening sessions throughout the community. We'll have an online survey, and we really want to hear from you. I hope you all have learned a lot about about uh, what Dockless Bike Share is and what it has to offer, what are the disadvantages, what are the advantages. So please get engaged in this process. This will only be successful with your support and input. Um, with that, we're gonna turn it over to Nicole to start us off with our policy panel. Thank you, Laura. Hi, my name is Nicole Payne. I am a program manager at NACDO, which is the National Association of City Transportation Officials. We're an association made up of about city, I'm sorry, 70 um, cities and transit agencies across North America, um, formed to help cities come together to share ideas, best practices, and help cities really make streets safer for people walking, for people biking, and also people taking transit. Um, so we're just going to dive right in. I know why you all are here. You want to hear them. Um, so we have a, a wonderful panel here today, and they're going to talk about um, what's happening in their cities in addition to giving a um, bio, introducing yourself to our crowd and the people watching on Facebook. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. So my name is Joel Miller. I'm with the Seattle DOT. Do I need to keep holding that? Yeah, I'm just going to do this one, because I don't know, that, that scares me. Uh, <laughs> so I'm uh, the bike share program manager for the Department of Transportation in Seattle. And um, Seattle, kind of a very, very quick bike share related history, because I think context is important. We had a dock-based system until about April of 2017. Um, and that went away for a lot of reasons, um, both just kind of how it worked and, and, um, and political. Um, so that left Seattle without a bike share system. It was kind of one of the only cities of its size in the U.S. that didn't have an operating system. And um, so that was in April. And um, a lot of the bike share companies that were um, starting to open up in, in the U.S. Um, then saw Seattle as this market that was didn't have a competing system. And so um, my predecessors at the Department of Transportation um, in a couple months went from sort of a blank Word document to the first really kind of large attempt to regulate dockless bike share in the U.S. with a, a pilot permit. And that launched in July of last year. And um, we started, uh, quickly had three companies come on board and um, kind of did a phased rollout. The company started at about 500 bikes each and then that grew month by month to well, where um, by October, November, they were at about um, 4,000 bikes each as their cap. They weren't all the way up at their cap, and um, we have about 10,000 bikes on the ground in Seattle now. So that's sort of the quick history. And then what we're doing now is we're doing a full evaluation of kind of um, that pilot and the pilot period, which we're calling the first six months of data, so through December 31st. And we really wanted to capture summer data and winter data as well. And then um, we're having a public outreach process. We're doing a lot of surveying work um, to see what worked with um, this dockless system and what didn't. Um, so some very, very quick stats. Um, we saw a really, really great mobility gain for the city. Um, we saw about 470,000 trips taken in that six month period. And um, to put that in context, compared to our previous docked system, we had about 270,000 trips in the docked based system in 30 months. So 470 in six months, 270 in 30 months. So really kind of a, um, difficult to really even compare. Um, we were excited with that, worked out to trips per day and trips per thousand residents at about three and a half trips per 1,000 residents. And um, that came with uh, bikes automatically going all over the city, and they really did. Um, they're obviously concentrated in some areas, but even in the first week um, with just 
you know, the first 500, 1,000 bikes out there, we saw them naturally kind of traveling all over the city, and, and we saw that as a, a big, big advantage. Um, so those are some of the quick early stats. Um, and then in the, that evaluation process, we're also um, looking carefully at the parking. Um, I know that's a large concern. It is for us. Um, some of our not really scientific studies, but our studies where we went out to neighborhoods and um, surveyed every bike on those blocks, we saw about 70% of bikes were parked correctly according to the terms of our permit. Um, about 27% were parked incorrectly, but we didn't really judge it as being a hazard. Um, our permit has very, very strict parking regulations, so maybe the wheel was outside of the bounds, but the rest of the bike was in. And then the remaining about two and a half, three percent were really big problems. And that's that three percent that we need to focus on. Um, a large part of our outreach process was with the Seattle's um, disability community and work with, with them on how can bike share and this free floating model um, work um, without restricting access for those that really need it the most. Um, we're seeing um, a large answer to that question is in the city building more bike parking capacity. So um, every city's different, but we're um, really only, only allowing parking in the furniture zone, so the space between like the main travel area of the sidewalk and the curb where it's paved. And large portions of the city don't have that, don't have a paved furniture zone. So we really need to build some capacity um, for this. Um, and um, and that answer, I think, um, really solved a lot of the problems if we can do it correctly and use um, these partnership opportunities with these companies to do that. Um, one quick wrap up, um, the public perception. We just wrapped up a couple different public surveys. Um, one, a valid survey asking folks how they felt about bike share. And I gotta tell you, like, Sitting um, in the Department of Transportation with I, my email on the website, I would say, man, everybody hates this. Like, what's going on? Like, the amount of emails that you get, um, and those that work in cities probably know that, um, of, you know, I don't like it because of the color. I don't like it because of this and that. Or I don't like it because I'm in a wheelchair and it blocks my way. Um, but the public surveys that we did um, showed actually about a 74% favorability rating. So this, the people of Seattle do like this. And, um, and about a third of the people had tried it and a third of the people were interested in trying it. Um, so it's really being used. Um, there are definitely some kinks um, that we uh, are excited to partner to, to try and figure out. But I think overall, um, it's been a successful pilot. Um, but I welcome everyone's questions, and I'm here just kind of give honest answers. Thanks. Just a quick um, admin note. If you are um, tuning in in the office or on Facebook, you can actually submit your questions now while the panel is speaking. And the tag for that is ATX panel, P-A-N-E-L. So go ahead and submit your questions now. Um, and I was told that we have a bunch of questions already in queue, so we're gonna get the, the, through these intros and we're gonna get to your questions as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll be brief. Um, I'm Jillian from the city and county of San Francisco. Um, so we have a regional bike share program because San Francisco is really part, increasingly part of a mega region in Northern California. Um, we work closely with the cities of San Jose and Oakland. Oh, sure. We, we work closely with the cities of San Jose and Oakland. Um, and San Francisco has a strong biking culture. Um, but in the region, we really have a, a very big first and last mile problem. Um, and we also have, uh, it's a good problem to have, but one of the big problems that we have with our commuter rail systems is that the, a, a lot of people are bringing their bikes onto the trains. Um, to the tune of our Caltrain commuter rail line, um, which runs between San Francisco and the 50 miles between San Francisco and San Jose, the trains carry about 80 bikes. Um, and each bike is probably takes up the space of a, two to three riders. So we're actually um, not letting people on Caltrain in the mornings. We're bumping people um, because there's insufficient capacity on the trains. Um, so we, uh, we really think a lot about our, our role in the region. 
um, and how we get people to transit. So our entire philosophy about our bike share system is really thinking about the public transit system, particularly the trains. And so as a result, we um, worked with our metropolitan planning organization to contract a regional program. So San Francisco sits in a contractual relationship through its MPO with um, uh, Motivate is our, is our bike share operator, Ford is our title sponsor, and it's a program that is consistent in Berkeley, Emeryville, San Jose, Oakland, and San Francisco. Um, and that was really important to us, not just for, because of the relationship to uh, transit, so that you had a consistent look and feel at any particular transit system, but also, um, well, let me back up a little bit. One of, one of our other problems that we're trying to solve is, um, in our nine county Bay Area region, we have about, well, we have over 25 transit operators. <laughs> so it's very confusing for people in the Bay Area to use transit, and we believe that people are using transit insufficiently because it's difficult to transfer from, it's, it's not very legible in the Bay Area which transit system to use. And so um, we wanted to try to address that in our bike share system, and and not have a, a bunch of different bike share operators. We really wanted to have a consistent look and feel all the way, all the way around the Bay Area. So um, our um, bike share system with uh, the Ford Go Bike system uh, launched in June. Um, within San Francisco, we now have 1,200 bikes uh, at 100 and, or I guess it's more like about 1,400 bikes across 122 stations. Um, it is very popular, very well used. It is uh, difficult to remove parking to put in stations, but that's really the only solution, in our opinion. Um, mm -hmm. At scale, you really need to think about, uh, in cities, you need to think about where you put bikes. Um, parking is always going to be an issue. And so, um, you know, we are tackling that head on with our bike share system. Um, we are also going. We are also experimenting with a dockless electric bike that's operated on a pilot program with Jump, um, which I think was pitching here this morning. Uh, so they have 250 electric pedal assist bicycles out um, on the streets that have been out for a couple of months, and in another six months they get to roll out another 250 bikes. Um, so I think this, I'm going to leave that for now and pass it on to you. Thanks. Thanks. I'll try to use this one. Okay. Does this work? Good? All right. Good morning. Uh, I'm John Michael Cortez. Uh, how many of y'all are from Austin? Just so I know. Most of you? Okay, cool. Uh, well, I'm here because I was told there'd be tacos uh, and some coffee, but uh, I really appreciate you all being here and uh, the folks visiting from other cities as well as the other uh, 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 companies that, that uh, are here to talk to us about what they do uh, because we all need to, to work on this together uh, so that we can answer what I think is the fundamental question here is how could we as a city and hopefully as a region uh, deploy mm -hmm. something like dockless bike share uh, in a way that could potentially solve more and bigger problems than it could potentially create. I mean, I think that's really uh, the fundamental question that I'm hoping to get uh, at least a partial answer to here today. Uh, but I work uh, here in Austin, and since we don't have direct experience yet uh, at, at scale with uh, uh, implementing dockless bike share in this city, I'll, I'll kind of go a little bit higher level with what I think is, is happening here in the city. Uh, I work for uh, Mayor Steve Adler, our mayor here in Austin, and uh, I advise him on a number of things, but primarily on transportation, land use, workforce development, and intergovernmental relations type things. And uh, I think more importantly than that, I'm a regular consumer of just about every mode of transportation that we have here in the city of Austin. And uh, I think generally what we're dealing with here in Austin uh, is the same thing that a Seattle's dealing with and to some degree the, the Bay Area is dealing with, and that's just how do we cope with rapid growth uh, here in our city. Uh, we're, we're a very growing, a uh, fast growing city, a very fast growing metropolitan area. We have been since uh, Austin was founded back in 1839 uh, uh, and have grown uh, rapidly ever since that date uh, through uh, uh, revolutions, uh, wars, uh, 1845, the fateful year when we allowed the United States to join with Texas. And uh, uh, 
you know, through uh, world wars, depressions, recessions, we've always grown very, very rapidly. Uh, but the, the growth that we've experienced here in Austin, the metropolitan area, I don't have to tell y'all, uh, has been even more pronounced. And like many of other uh, growing U.S. cities, there's a lot of really good things that happen with that dynamic growth. But it also exacerbates some of the challenges that have been vexing us for many, many years. And primarily, uh, that's around affordability. Uh, it's around equity. Uh, we have some very pernicious and growing uh, disparities in outcomes, both economic and health and transportation uh, here in the city that are becoming even more pronounced, uh, partly as a result of our rapid growth. And so when we're talking about potential new solutions, potential new tools to add to our mobility toolbox, I can tell you, from, from, at least from my, my own perspective, my, my first question is, what is this potentially going to do to address some of the challenges that we face as a growing city with very pronounced disparities? Uh, I've used dockless bike share. I've used the uh, electric uh, uh, dockless bikes and the scooters, and they're all really cool. I've also used uh, and used quite frequently our, our station-based system here, and they're great. And the technology is great, and it's cool, and it's exciting. But that isn't the end, right? Well, we have to ask ourselves, what problem is this going to help us solve? And I think that's what we want your help with here today and, and over the next couple of days. So uh, generally, uh, what I see uh, as having happened over the last several years, and what I hope will continue to happen here in the city with regard specifically to transportation, is creating more places in our city where people have equitable access to a multiplicity of transportation choices to meet their unique needs and to help connect them to the things that they need in our city, the resources and the opportunities for them to lead uh, a successful life here. Uh, we have many areas in our city where over the last year, uh, several years, we've done this. We have several communities in this city where you have access to a diversity of options and people are thriving. The challenge is, is that we have too few of those places and we need to expand uh, opportunity in a number of places where they have access to things like robust transit service and, and uh, uh, good safe infrastructure that accommodates things like uh, uh, cycling and, and walking and, and driving. Uh, you know, it, from our focus, we need to get the basics right. Uh, we need to have transportation infrastructure that accommodates all of these diversity of choices because it doesn't matter whether you're on a, your own bike or a, a, a B-cycle or a, a, a docked uh, bike share or a dockless bike or a scooter. You're going to need good, safe infrastructure. And so that's a major focus of our city. Uh, it has been and will continue to be uh, for the next several years. Preach. So... Uh, <laughs> As I told you, I could talk about this all day, so okay. I'll stop and let's get to questions. Keep right. going, you're good. Yeah, really good. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're now going to segue into our Q&A portion of this event. Um, this is a phone-based system, so if you see me looking at my phone, I'm not texting, I promise. I'm reading your questions. Um, and we can go ahead and get started. So the first question, oops, sorry. The first question is, what enforcement tools do cities have when companies do not meet our standards, whether rebalancing, data privacy, right-of-way issues, or other concerns? I guess that's for me. It's <laughs> <laughs> for all of us. I, I think I got this on now. Does this work? Yeah. yeah. Just lean forward. OK. Um, Compliance is a, um, a large question, especially with this dockless model where the city is kind of handing off all the operations to a, a private operator. Um, there's a number of ways, and it, it's kind of a, a much longer, larger question than can be answered here, and it's something we haven't figured out, to be honest. Um, there's the data side, and um, there's a lot of different solutions to that data problem. In the state of Washington, we have um, some very, very, I guess, strict, from my perspective, um, public information laws that are, are great. But if we were to collect um, all of the data that we want directly from the bike share companies, 
That would include some very, very specific origin and destination data that um, a nefarious actor could use cross-tab with other data and figure out who's doing those rides and who's doing what and where are they going. Um, and they could just request that from us and we'd have to give it out. And so we're using a third party um, kind of intermediary through our local university, the University of Washington, and they are actually collecting the data from the companies directly. They're getting um, probably more data than we would ever be able to get because of those laws and um, then giving us reports and doing the compliance work for things like fleet size, for density, um, and those issues. The parking issue is the tricky one. And um, we do some ground checking, but that's not really scalable. Um, we, our permit is written on kind of the complaint response hook. Um, so the companies need to respond to a complaint pretty quickly, within two hours during business hours. Um, that's probably not the best answer we're finding. Um, you know, it's just a lot to ask people if you walk to a bike to complain about it. And the best people will move that bike. But that doesn't solve the larger problem of how do people actually park correctly in the first place. So I think um, our next permit iteration will work more on directly solving that problem, um, compelling the companies to do more for that. I was excited to hear a lot of the pitches that sounds like more work is being done. I'm excited to see that in Seattle. Um, and then the question is, how do we check compliance? Is it uh, an audit system? Is it having compliance officers? Probably more the former than the latter, but we're still figuring this out, and this is going to keep changing. Um, so I think all the cities uh, should keep talking as, as we try and solve these problems. Yeah, I mean, I think I would agree with uh, what Joel said, um, it's it, fundamentally, you know, the cities are not in a position to be able to enforce much at all, frankly. Um, you know, we've already seen with the rollout of, of the transportation network companies in California, the, uh, you know, and in other cities, the, the increased amount of congestion that we're seeing um, in cities. So while we laud the, um, while we laud the, the new mobility options, um, there's definitely some secondary impacts that, that need to be addressed. Um, and they're really difficult for cities to deal with because the context of play is both happening on our city streets, but it's also help happening in the realm of data. And cities don't write software. Um, we don't have a lot of exper expertise with intellectual pro property. Um, and we're also very concerned with privacy at the same time. So it's a, it's a difficult um, and emerging conversation for us to have. I will say that, um, since we don't have a dockless system uh, in the wild going in San Francisco, our experience with the dockless systems that are around us is that when they've been impounded um, <clears throat> for um, you know, being in the wrong place or, 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 or broken in some way, um, the city agencies or city-related agencies that have picked up the bikes have contacted the companies, and the bikes don't get picked up. Um, so you can see them on the apps that the, you know, their bikes clustered in places around San Francisco. They're not accessible to the public and they're in impound lots. And so I think what's going on there is that the cost of the bikes is so low that it's not worth it for them to be picked up. And that is troublesome to me. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult proposition for, for cities to provide enforcement. And I think, uh, I think it's an exciting conversation and we should have it. Um, uh, the, the, the idea that the companies are really thinking about data and technology as a way to sort of self-enforce through audits is an interesting one. Um, I, I'm curious to know, um, to learn more about um, how that can happen in a, in a way that doesn't um, invade people's privacy sort of more than we're already seeing with some of the other applications. I'm personally concerned about you know, the level of data that's being collected by the companies. And I agree that there are problems with that, a big chunk of that problem, that data being shared with cities because generally we have to provide, uh, we, it's our policy to provide open data. So if somebody gives us data and then somebody else asks for it, we have to give it to them. Um, so that's a, that's a real problem for the public and private to work out. 
Um, and I think Elliot is working on using a third party. Um, that's an interesting idea. Um, and we'll see how it progresses. So it's a, you know, it's an evolving conversation, but I think, you know, there's some pretty, pretty serious cautionary tales just this week about, you know, very recently about what's going on um, in the realm of, of privacy. We do not have a, a, a national privacy policy in the United States. The European, just ro European Union just rolled one out. I personally think that we should have a national privacy policy. I don't think that we will get one anytime soon. Um, so perhaps this, because this, um, perhaps because privacy um, is, is moving, the privacy issue is coming at us fastest through the mobility sector, um, we will, you know, start to float privacy policies through the mobility sector. Maybe that's the way we go, but I want everybody to start thinking about this. I think it's really important that, um, that here in Austin and elsewhere when you're thinking about sort of app app-enabled mobility solutions that you read the terms of service and that you read the privacy policies of the operators. It's really important to know that um, you are the product, that you know, there is no way that um, these solutions are, they don't make money. The money, the money that they're ma being made is probably coming through the information about you. Um, and that's something that you should think about and, and read about, and we're all going to come to grips with it together. Well, I'd just say that this is one of the areas where I think Austin has an opportunity to learn from the other communities that are, that are ahead of us in, in uh, uh, trying some of these new solutions. But I think it's, uh, you know, it remains to be seen. I, I, I think it'll have to be some sort of balance between uh, the city's ability to to regulate and what the uh, private companies are doing to regulate their own users, you know something analogous to this uh, would be uh, you know I'm a I frequent user of Cardigo, so uh, Cardigo has specific rules for how and where you are able to park those vehicles, and allegedly, I am guilty of not having parked them in the right way in the right place. It's alleged. <laughs> Um, and so, and hypothetically, I could have known at the time that I wasn't parking it correctly, and I really wasn't worried about, you know, ATD, you know, close your ears, about parking enforcement, but what got me to change my ways was Cardigo saying, hey, buddy, you park this way again, we're going we're gonna to fine you a hundred bucks. So, that, so I think it's probably going to be some sort of combination of, of uh, the, uh, the uh, operators and the city, but I think, again, it goes back to that question. Uh, uh, to what end and, and how much is really uh, appropriate. You know, if we find ourselves in a situation where, you know, there's always going to be some bad actors uh, in any system, but uh, to, to what degree are we seeing that bad behavior and is over-regulating it going to create, again, more problems than it might be solving? So. If, if we regulate these companies in such a way that reduces the amount of bad behavior to a very minuscule amount, but yet by regulating we're limiting access to people, I think we should have that conversation. If we find ourselves in a situation through excessive regulation where maybe we only have uh, you know, two or three uh, percent of the bikes uh, parked in a way that we would not uh, normally permit, but we're limiting access to people, to big swaths of our community who really actually need that transportation option to meet their daily needs, I think that's a conversation we ought to have. Uh, again, with the understanding that we're probably always gonna have some violations and some bad behavior, and that's why uh, people like the mayor and, and folks get elected to make those difficult decisions about trade-offs, and I think that's the discussion we're gonna have to have but we'll have it with the benefit of having learned from these other communities. Thank you, and I'm gonna combine a few questions into one um, general question. So, um, transportation is a public service and essentially a public good. What are your thoughts on um, requiring or working with dockless companies to commit funds to improve local bike infrastructure? I'll go again. Um, I think that's important. I think um, 
the companies are private and they're coming in and they're providing a, a great mobility service, but there are impacts and um, these are companies that are, are set up to make money. And I think um, right now uh, the city of Seattle charges a, a kind of a per bike permit fee that um, allows this. It even it pays for my hours that I work on bike share. It pays for um, the unfortunate interns that I have running around checking on how bikes are parked and things like that. And um, in our next permit iter iteration, we're talking with the companies on how much more we can expand that fee um, to really start making the room for bike share to work. And that's where I was talking about um, some of these designated parking areas. <coughs> um, we've rolled out a few kind of trial <laughs> balloons um, in the city with that, but really to scale it, um, we need a lot more. And to really say that bike share covers the city and, and uh, not have to use air quotes um, or say, you know, technically under the permit, um, we need to build more capacity, especially in some of the single family zones and the outlying neighborhoods where pre people need this. Um, so I think that's a, a discussion that we're having. It's a discussion that cities should have. and. Um, it's uh, I think it's important and it's a good question. All right, I'm, I'm told that I need to use the microphone. Am I using the microphone adequately? <laughs> um, good. So look, I think, um, yes, cities, American cities, of course, you can't be in the transportation business on the public side unless you want to um, expand mobility options for people. Um, it's something that we really want to do. Um, <clears throat> but it's hard work. Don't forget that in the last transportation, you know, mobility revolution, um, with the car, we sort of unbuilt and rebuilt and sort of mangled a bunch of cities and created a bunch of winners and losers. Um, for people of color, we often created a community of lo losers by driving freeways through cities and cutting back sidewalks. And in my neighborhood, moving houses onto the rears of their lots so that people have a backyard so we could make room for freeways. I mean, you know, like, we've had kind of a difficult um, and tortured history with um, transportation improvements in the United States. And it's important that we get this one right, that this time we mend some of the mistakes that we made last time. So uh, in San Francisco, at least, we've um, repeatedly gone to the voters to raise money to build bicycle infrastructure. And we've, we've done pretty well. Um, we're not, we've done a lot of the easy things, and now we're getting to the, the bits that are a lot harder, which do involve things like taking out more lanes of traffic and taking out parking to build out bike lanes. That's hard work of cities to do. And so, yes, we're committed, but I think it's, you know, the reason you have, a, you have cities doing this work um, is that we have a long relationship with the public we are required to work with the public, we're required to provide equitable access. Um, and as a result, we really understand, we're all, cities are all about balance. We understand the trade-offs, and we understand how difficult, the, the, the things that you have to balance and the amount of time that it takes to balance them in order to move forwards without upsetting the public. Um, it's, and so, yes, we're committed, but this is not easy work. Well, if, if, I think if I understand the question, what do we think about charging or, or you know, taxing or however you want to do it, some of these uh, operators to help pay for infrastructure. Um, well, I think we're somewhat limited in that regard, um, and the regulators can correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as what we can do as far as with uh, fees uh, for those companies, we can only really charge them what it costs us to regulate them, right? Correct. Uh, and to the degree that we're levying some additional fee in order to pay for infrastructure or something else, then we're not really levying it against that operator. We're levying, levying it against the user, mm -hmm. uh, which has its own challenges and could potentially lead to some inequities, depending on who's using it and for what reason. So I think we have to be careful there. But um, if it's in the real interest of these operators to have more people using their actual uh, service, then I think it would very much be in their interest to have a conversation with the city and our partners about how we could work together to fund more infrastructure. Because again, and our uh, uh, active transportation folks have reams of data on this, if we have good, safe, accessible infrastructure, more people will bike, more people will walk, more people will take transit. So it would very much be in their interest, not for us to demand that they help us fund these infrastructure improvements, 
But again, if their real financial interest in, in play here is to have a lot of users, then they should be doing everything they can to help us fund protected uh, bike infrastructure, our all ages and ability network. That's very much in their interest. So I would love to have that conversation uh, with them when the time comes. Awesome. Thank you. Can I take just a quick rebuttal of that a little bit? I think it's important also, though, to remember that, yes, I mean, in California, it's the same position that, tech, that Texas is in. We, the fees on things, the difference between a fee and a tax, you can't make money on fees, right? So you can only tra charge the cost to implement the, 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 the regulatory structure. Um, but it's important to remember in this context of asking the companies to pay with us that um, several of these, the, the new mobility actors, they're venture capital funded startups. They are not in position to make investments in much other than their own company. They are, they are operating on borrowed money to prove a business model. They are not going to come up with the large um, capital infrastructure dollars that are required to fix cities. So that's, you have to understand the context in which you're asking the question. Thank you. Um, and it seems like a constant theme throughout you all's answers is equitable service. So our next question is, how do cities ensure that dockless providers provide equitable service, especially to more far-flung and economically disadvantaged communities? I guess I'm going first. Um, Go, Joel. We start like a precedent. That's what happens with cities, guys. You set a precedent and you can't get out of it. Um, if it goes wrong, it's yeah. your fault. <laughs> um, equity is a large concern with, uh, with transportation in general, with cities. Um, and our initial permit, this pilot that we're operating under, um, didn't do enough. So essentially, we just required that the company's service area cover some of our areas of concern. Um, and they did it right away by covering the whole city. So it's kind of like check that box. And that's, um, that's not as much as we want to see going forward. Now that said, um, this dockless system compared to no system or compared to the system we had before um, is light years ahead in terms of equity. It, it, it's there. Um, our old system wasn't, and obviously no system wasn't. Um, but um, looking forward, um, we know there's a lot of work to do. Um, we need to do a lot of outreach, um, see what the communities need, what they want, um, what their comfort level is. Um, there is the very, very large concern of the infrastructure. If we put the bikes there, where are people riding if the infrastructure is not built? Um, and. Um, and so there, there, there's a lot of complicated factors, I guess. But there, there is, I think, in the next iteration, um, some promising avenues. Um, in you know, we haven't written this permit that I keep talking about yet. That's what I'll be doing on the airplane back today. So, <laughs> um, but um, make sure to send us a copy of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they will. The. Um, you know, there, there's kind of your, your monetary barrier, um, and I think the companies have made some interesting proposals today, but that's something we could work into our permit um, to, to lower that, that access um, or that barrier. Um, there's the smartphone barrier, and I think that's also kind of a, a large that tech barrier, your banking barrier. Um, we're talking to some of the companies about what could be done with that and what we should require in our permit for much larger programs. They've rolled out some small programs, but it hasn't scaled, and we haven't seen the type of kind of uptake with that, um, with like the cashless model or the, the smartphoneless model. Um, and then there's the knowledge barrier, and that's really just, um, you know, we're probably everyone in this room is on their smartphones and on the blogs and kind of savvy. Um, and it's for this to be an equitable tool. Um, people need to know about it and they need to know how to use it and they need to be um, invested in it. And so kind of just starting with that ground level outreach of talking to communities, seeing what they need and then making sure they know about bike share. It's all important. We haven't figured it out, um, but I'm optimistic that we can start to at least work much more towards that than our previous model. 
Um, so like I can tell you what we did in our contract, we don't have a really great answer either. We required that in our bike share system that 30% or a minimum of 20% of the bikes are in what are called communities of concern in the Bay Area. It's a, it's a Bay Area wide definition of low income communities. And Motivate has exceeded that. I think there are over 30% overall. We also required a low income um, membership. So uh, the unbanked can walk into San Francisco public libraries or certain locations with you know twenty uh, with uh, five dollars in quarters or whatever, um, and as long as they're qualifying for a, a, a low income program that we have Bay Area wide, they can get an annual membership for five dollars in cash. And I think that um, of our twelve thousand members or so in the in the in the Ford Go Bike system, about twenty five hundred of them are um, low income riders. So that's. That's a really a, a great success story. Um, we would I would love for the for the bike share system to be bigger um, and to reach more of the Bay Area. Um, it has not been the case in the Bay Area that we are willing to tax ourselves to pay for a publicly funded bike share system. That's the reality that we that exists in the Bay Area. Transit is massively underfunded already. So to ask public transit to take public transit dollars um, and move them to another mode has not been possible for us. Um, so we've been pretty convinced at the same time that bike share is a, that is a business or very close to being a business. And so that's um, why we're in the situation that we're in. Um, but we would, we'd love more money um, uh, for us or for Motivate to, to expand the system. That would be really terrific. But I think that there's a little bit of a false um, a false decision that's being made here. I'm not personally interested in a low cost or purportedly free um, system that's being billed as equitable if it's at the expense of the consumer's private information. Like I think that that's a false decision. Um, and we really need, in my opinion, to get to the bottom of that, particularly at this time in our country. Um, I think that there's certain data that's being collected about people through these mobility apps that is very concerning. <laughs> um, and to sell it as an equity play is troublesome, in my opinion. Sure, you can clap. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Um, you know, again, this is another area where I'm, I'm excited to see, and I think we all are, uh, how other cities handle it. How can we ensure that there is uh, equitable access to, to these types of services? And I think it, at the end of the day, it'll probably be some sort of a combination of uh, uh, potentially uh, us requiring some degree of access in, in certain areas that are uh, uh, where the, that are disadvantaged. Uh, but you know, I, I think that there's probably a limit to how much again, and not understanding their business model completely, you know, at, to, to, to what degree are they able to do that and still maintain their sustainability as, a, as an organization or as a business? And so, you know, in, in uh, you know, years past, we say, well, that's a shame. They, you know, I, let me say, find something that's analogous. I, I kind of look at it. We got a lot of food. Good morning, man. Have your attention, please. Well, you do now. Thank you. Woohoo! All right. Um, it's kind of analogous. We, we've got a number of food deserts uh, in, in the city. And, you know, people uh, don't have access to fresh and healthy food. So we've kind of, everybody's kind of wrung their hands. How can we, you know, God, would it be great to have a grocery store out there? But we know that a grocery store has to have certain markets in place in order to be sustainable. So we haven't had grocery stores out there. But we finally started having the conversation with the grocers. Hey, what, what, what would you actually need in terms of a subsidy for a period of years to actually open there before the market gets there, and, and perhaps that's a that's a, co a question we could have, you know, to some degree requiring uh, the service providers to say you've got to locate at least some degree of access mm -hmm. in these communities. But in these communities where it's not economically viable for you to provide service, what would it take as a subsidy uh, in order for the service to be offered there at, a, at at an equitable level as these other places where it's obviously more economically viable. I think it might potentially be some combination of those two things. Uh, the, again, something analogous that, that's along these lines. There was an article in the, uh, uh, I think it was in the Statesman, at least online yesterday, you know, with the transportation network companies, you know, you know ostensibly they can provide service anywhere uh, within the city and actually outside the city, 
but obviously the access is, is, is diminished for people who can't afford them. So uh, we here locally have a, a, an innovative little program for us where we had uh, Capital Metro through a foundation called the Transit Empowerment Fund uh, awarding a grant to our local health community care collaborative working with our local nonprofit rideshare company Ride Austin to subsidize and in many cases provide for free medical trips for folks who would not otherwise have access so they could keep their dialysis appointments so they could you know go see their primary care doctors so they could pick up prescriptions and they found a great degree of success there i think that it could be a combination of both some requirements as a as a condition of having a permit and some community subsidy if we find that it's worth it and again that's a conversation that we all need to have as a community and that the council needs to have Awesome. Thank you so much. So as you probably heard, um, we are running out of time. So we have time for one last question. Um, and that's actually for our host, the city of Austin. Um, how does bike share and you kind of um, talked about this a bit, but specifically, um, the audience wants to know how does bike share of all types fit into your plans for improving mobility? Well, generally, it fits in our plan at a high level in that we need to expand the access and the diversity of options throughout our city. Where we've done this, uh, along with good infrastructure, with much better land use, with investments in transit service, it's working. Uh, one way to measure this would be, and it's, a, it's the, the measure, and I saw Ben Ware left, so I wish you were still here. Probably the worst statistic that we can't get away from is the ACS commute mode share. I hate that data, but <laughs> if you look at it, if you, if you look at the data, and Ben likes to always, sorry Ben, I'm gonna talk about him even though he's not here, pull out, well, what is the regional commute mode shares you know, it's, uh, for transit or for cycling? It's, it's low, but we're talking about a six county area, right? If you look at uh, zip codes and census tracts, where we've actually got good bike infrastructure, where we have access to, to station-based systems, where we have transit service, where we actually have damn sidewalks, where there's actually good land use, where there's actually destinations to walk or to bike to, we have some places in this city where the commute mode share that's not driving alone is like two thirds. And we have a lot of places where we have these things present where it's 15, 20, 30%. It works, the problem is is that that's not enough places, and the places where we have those are, being, are becoming increasingly unaffordable. Uh, so we need to scale up access to all of those things in many more places, and I, for one, would suggest we need to scale them up first in those places where they're most needed. Uh, and so certainly bike share of all types is a big piece of that. Uh, you know, the city obviously was an uh, investor and an owner in, in our local uh, uh, station-based uh, bike share operation. Uh, we just won uh, regional uh, uh, dollars to expand that system. Uh, I think that a conversation that we need to have is how we can leverage that system and expand it along some of the transportation corridors that were funded in our last mobility bond where we're putting in good bike infrastructure and expanding our all ages and ability network. You know, I don't think for one, at the end of this, it's going to be dockless, uh, uh, an either or between dockless or the station base. I think they'll both persist. We know that the station base works. Uh, uh, our, our local uh, station base system just had a tremendous launch uh, uh, on the University of Texas campus, finally. Uh, uh, you, know, you know, during uh, our special events, it's the only way to get around, quite frankly, uh, is, is cycling and, and our, I think our station-based uh, system in general. So I think that we will expand that because we know it works. And meanwhile, uh, as that's expanding, let's see if these uh, dockless options can help us, again, solve more problems than we could potentially create. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to our audience. Thank you to everyone tuning in on our Facebook. Um, that wraps up our panel for today. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and um, thank you. <laughs>